Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Henry, Henry Franzoni. <clears throat> I'm an old Bigfoot guy. Been not paying any attention to any thing going on for 23 years or so, since 2000. I've been ignoring everybody. But I've been off doing my own thing. I just haven't been talking. Now I'm, <clears throat> pardon me, now I'm back. And I feel like talking about Bigfoot. And as I see the community right now, and the state of affairs of today, a new Bigfoot person explained to me, it's all about ape versus woo. And I said, what? Ape versus woo, huh? That's what it's all about. Well, I really don't like that. I mean, let me count the ways. First of all, when you say ape, you're precluding or at least suggesting that this is not a person that you are looking at. This is an animal. And so you're making an assumption right off the bat about what you're looking at and the nature of its intelligence, the nature of its mind, the level of its thinking, and the ability of it to communicate its educational attainment, if you will. You make a lot of assumptions when you call something an ape. It's dehumanizing the object you're looking at. <coughs> <clears throat> now, when you say woo on the other side, you're dehumanizing the person who is making this objective determination, let us call it. They're probably telling you a story that's pretty outlandish and contains some difficult-to-prove claims that seem impossible and therefore it's labeled woo here you are dehumanizing the observer ape you're dehumanizing the observed either way these are strategies for avoiding any kind of empathy or compassion with what you're looking at or who's doing the looking. Both of these are clever ways to dehumanize you, the person that is either not thinking that this is an ape, or who says something that can't be proven immediately in a laboratory. Anyhow, speaking of that, proving in a laboratory stuff, how do you get from footprints to ape? I mean, how do you know that footprints and hair samples yield ape in the end and not person? You've got to make a lot of assumptions to get from A to B, right? <clears throat> I would think. And I'd also think you have to really use a lot of supposition and plausibility. In the end, you're really going to be talking about plausibility is why you think these footprints and these hair samples are from an ape and not from a person. A kind of person. Let's call it a person, not necessarily a human being. Another kind of person. 
one that, yes, taxonomically is probably related to us. They look like us, don't they? But they are different than us, aren't they? But they look like us. They look like primates. They look like hominids. At least some of the time they do. And we try our best, the anthropologists among us, try our best to fit them into Carl Linnaeus's taxonomy. Because we know we can get it in there somewhere. We can fit it in somewhere around Ape, orangutan, gorilla, hominid, something, homo erectus, whatever. I leave that to others to pursue. I'm not so interested in the placement of this being, entity, intelligent being, person is what I want to call it in the taxonomic tree somewhere and if you get the DNA you dream of perhaps you will be able to place it in the taxonomic tree somewhere um, they certainly seem to be related to us don't they now <clears throat> all right so when you talk about a person versus an ape you're talking about a civilization, you're talking about culture, you're talking about society, you're talking about another society. So the big question that I see that needs to be asked is, do you think human beings are the only intelligent civilization that lives on Earth? I think everybody has to answer that question for themselves based on their own experiences. Anyhow, there's certainly a lot of weird stories that if you connect the dots kind of lead to that big picture conclusion that there's another society that surrounds us or is nearby in some way but yet at arm's length. At least that's the sense one gets from pursuing Bigfoot and pursuing the little people and a number of other phenomenon. Anyhow, I'm going to not tell these stories, you know, I'm <clears throat> in the first place, I'm kind of not really up for trying to persuade people that this is real, but on the other hand, I got to present you some ideas to consider because I think it's real. I'm going to paint a big picture. I'm not going to tell you all these stories about Bigfoot and UFOs and pterodactyls and little people. No, I'm going to paint a big picture using Einstein in part to describe physics that would enable a, another civilization to coexist with us in this place we live, with us not really crossing each other's paths and each going our own way. So I'm going to kind of give you this uh, view of what I think is going on around here, and I'm going to mix it with what I know you want to hear because you want to hear the cool Bigfoot stories and other things but I'm going to mix in what I want to tell you with what you want to hear so I can somehow slip it in there Ah, so I don't really think I should slam anybody I, I love everyone in the world now the um the thing is, is that as I reintroduce myself to all of you, I have to introduce my different take on things because I think you've grown used to the same old takes for most people. Like you're really hardly, or things seem to have turned into sports where everybody has their own sports team and they 
root for that sports team and stories that confirm what they've already decided is true, that's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear anything that goes against what they've already decided is true. And that goes for pretty much everybody in the Bigfoot community, and I don't blame them, you know. But um, I'm going to give you a little background how I got to where I'm at because I have a different view of everything. Way, way back when I invented a database to put Bigfoot reports in for the Bigfoot Research Project in 1993. And we went around and we collected 485 reports around Oregon and Washington and analyzed them and looked for geotime patterns in the data. And we had a team of people that went around and interviewed the witnesses and had questionnaires that they gave the witnesses to fill out. We had a very early GPS coordinate system. It was accurate within 300 feet and that's all that was allowed back in 1993 by the U.S. government. We citizens could not have GPS more accurate than that back then. But anyhow, as we collected data, we also ran a 1-800-BIGFOOT number to collect reports because that was our mode for the first three to five of five years we operated. Collecting reports was a big deal. And what we did was assign a credibility rating to each report from 1 to 16. 1 was the most credible, 16 was the least credible. And this was a completely subjective opinion based on, well, you know, what we thought about the people, what we knew about the people, experiences we had had, or the look, their, their position in the hierarchy of society, etc etc and I noticed that we always dismissed reports that did not agree with our predefined viewpoint of what was going on now I think a lot of people are guilty of that but the thing is is that when I look at all the different databases today the thing that strikes me is that they're so clean and they've been filtered of all the weird reports and all the kooky things are largely removed from the big databases that are online. And it's always been that way. Reports always get classified. People have to filter hoaxes out. But I believe that a lot of the gems are actually contained in some of those reports that really seem off the wall at first. Ray Crow, in the track record that he put out, his newsletter, he was an early collector of stories and he never judged the credibility of the storytelling. He talked about individual readers wearing their skepticals when they read the stories. So he left it to people in their own individual judgment. He didn't prejudge the wackiness of a story, and that helped me formulate an opinion that encompassed a larger amount of possibilities than the simple possibilities that could explain what was clearly some kind of ape. So in other words, this happens all over, and it's a natural tendency of people. All the news organizations in America spike all the stories that are weird, you know, as a matter of course, because, they, you know, you just, you can't report that stuff. It's, it's just not done. And that carries over to the Bigfoot world. Well, I don't know. Bigfoot world, you have so many kooks. You maybe need to filter them, eh? It's a tough call, but I just thought I would tell you that this is part of why I developed a theory 
to include all of the weird stuff as well as all the flesh and blood stuff. All of the above I wanted to include in one encompassing theory, a universal Bigfoot theory. I'm guessing that there's no way you think it's possible for two civilizations to exist on Earth and not be aware of each other. Well, you're right about that. One civilization is completely aware of the other civilization. However, the other civilization, which is Western civilization, our civilization, we've confined this knowledge to a very, very small number of people and wrapped it up tight in the blackest of the black projects. At least that's been my opinion. The uh, other civilizations, well, let's say cultures within Western civilization or adjacent to Western civilization, the tribal cultures and indigenous cultures around the world, they have a lot more interaction with this other civilization than Western civilization. Well, I don't know about more, but um, more open is what I mean to say in that the elders of many indigenous cultures have experience and have uh, knowledge, direct knowledge of interacting with this other civilization. In fact, there's many other civilizations. There's not just one other civilization. So, of course, we're talking about dimensions. We're talking about one civilization lives in one dimension, one civilization lives in another dimension. <clears throat> but this means we have to define what dimensions are. And since nobody knows what dimensions are, we have to propose a theory, a valid theory about what dimensions are exactly and how this mechanism actually works. How can these civilizations be superimposed on each other in this place we live? And do we need new physics to explain this? Well, no, we don't. We need to reinterpret some of what Einstein left us or actually look deep into his equations to see some other predictions that his equations contained inside them. So I think there's an open book of physics and a closed book of physics that our military has kept wrapped up tight. And our society is one that restricted knowledge of Einstein, Einstein's other interpretations, and the knowledge of other civilizations to a handful of people, and chances are you're not one of those people. But I think it's all coming out now. Unlike other people in the world today, I think the government's spilling the beans about all this stuff and that it's a calculated scheduled leak that's occurring right now, bit by bit, that we are being fed crumbs and being allowed to connect the dots. So I'm going to use general relativity to explain how multiple dimensions work. In order to do that, I'm going to reinterpret general relativity after multiplying it by a constant. Now, I didn't think of this. Of course, I did and didn't think of this. I'm a student of history and the history of science, and in my recent book I put out, I show how I studied a lot of different things to one day hit upon this when I was watching a podcast with Dr. Salvatore Payas from uh, the New U.S. Navy and now the U.S. Space um, Force, I think. He's working for the Space Force now. Anyhow, 
I saw an interview with Dr. Salvatore Payas, and I realized that the government was spilling the beans about how lots of things worked and about this closed book of physics that I mentioned earlier. And Einstein's general relativity, you know, equals mc squared and all that. The thing is, is that the Einstein field equations are really the heart of relativity, where he explains the relationship between the curvature of space-time and the motion of matter, energy, and momentum, and how that affects the curvature of space-time. And what I'm going to show you is how a uh, small constant changes the meaning of Einstein's equations. Well, that's not really right. It, one can reinterpret the equations after one multiplies by a small constant. So I'm trying to give you a layman's picture. You know, I'm trying to in pictures and words explain what multiple dimensions really means and how dimensional technology really works. And this involves our friends of the big feet very much because they're masters of dimensional technology, in my opinion. Okay, shillin' for the book time. So, I wrote this book, Failing in a Cooler Way, recently, 2023, where I try to explain what I'm going to try to explain here in this little video, except I go right to the equations, and Stephen Hawking mentioned that anytime you put an equation in your book, you lose half your readership. And I believe that's true, and I I have like three equations in my book, so I don't think anyone reads it past the first ten pages. And I'm hoping to just put across my ideas in a more palatable manner. I'm not a physicist. I am a scientist, but a biologist. I understand something about physics because I took a couple years of it in college. However, you know, I've had this simple idea that I wonder why mainstream physicists have not gone in this direction and investigated this area of physics. So, this is the radiation pyramid, I call it, the energy pyramid. This is the big picture, number one. What this is trying to explain, this diagram, is what the universe looks at when you're just looking at radiation, electromagnetic radiation, any kind of radiation, gravitational radiation, perhaps. But what this means is that at the higher wavelengths, because radio, radiation, radioactivity, it's always AC. It's always alternating current. This is why Tesla was so big on radiation, because radiation is AC. Um, that aside, as you get to a higher and higher frequency, you get to a smaller and smaller scale, and the wavelength becomes smaller and smaller as the frequency gets higher and higher. And that's what I have here on two sides of this pyramid. Frequency goes up, up, up towards the peak, and wavelength gets smaller, smaller, smaller as you go up to the peak. So, looking at the big chunks, what I'm trying to describe here is that general relativity describes everything above the Planck length, because 
Here, in this place we live, according to Einstein, there is no zero. The smallest thing is actually the Planck length. Zero exists beyond space-time, according to Einstein and his theory of general relativity. Okay, so I put that boundary, the size of the Planck length, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 37 meters, as the first line down from the top of the pyramid. That is really the critical boundary in our universe, as Einstein's general relativity explains it. So everything above that line, general relativity explains. The very smallest edge of it, quantum mechanics explains. And we know through Schrodinger's equations and Dirac's modification, where he brought relativity to Schrodinger's equations, the Dirac equations basically form the basis for quantum mechanics as we know it today. And yes, the quantum vacuum is that chunk that is explained by quantum mechanics. The quantum vacuum is above the Planck length. It is next to the Planck length. One edge of the vacuum is the Planck length. And the world of heat, light, the world that we see, this place we live, that is what lays on top of the quantum vacuum. Anyhow, if we go back to the little part of the pyramid above the Planck length, you can see I have the Planck force there the speed of light to the fourth power over g, which is the Newtonian gravitational constant. And then I have something I call the superforce, which is c to the fourth over 8 pi g, which is almost the same thing as the Planck force, but there's another factor of 8 pi added to it. This is Einstein's uh, addition, as I will explain shortly. Anyhow, one of the key things I'm trying to propose here is that, and I'll show you how Einstein's equation may represent this, is that the edge of space-time is the Planck length, and beyond the edge of space-time, energy is unbound. It doesn't have to obey the speed limit rules that it has to obey in space-time. So the speed of light is no longer the bound upper speed limit of energy. So Einstein's the man. He uh, left us three clues about how to solve the problem of a unified field theory. And one can use his own equations to do it, surprisingly enough. Um, he left three big clues that I now can look at and say in plain sight for all of us. One is he said, quantum mechanics is not wrong, it's incomplete. Hmm. The other thing he said, he's famous for it, is God does not play dice. Mm -hmm. And then the last paper he wrote it's kind of famous because it was the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper where entanglement was hinted at and entanglement was encountered, at least in a thought experiment. Nevertheless, Einstein asked the question of entanglement, the superluminal connection or faster than light connection that may exist between all things. All right. So Einstein just blows me away. Einstein is smarter than I ever thought. And Einstein already was like one of the smartest human beings I ever knew of. 
kind of a cult of personality, and I don't really like cults of personality, but in this case, Einstein's physics seemed to be predictive beyond belief. Anyhow, I'm going to try to explain this to you without very much math, like as little math as possible at the most abstract level, so we can just have the 50,000 foot view as I try to explain how to tweak Einstein's field equations just one little bit and why we would do that. Why we would do that is this. Einstein thought that <clears throat> gravity was the curvature of space-time and that the motion of matter, energy, and momentum and distribution of matter, energy, and momentum in the universe altered the curvature of space-time, which is what gravity is. Gravity is not a force in the traditional manner, thought Einstein. It is the curvature of space-time. So, in the most abstract way, if we just look at those three abstract blobs there on the Einstein field equation, g <clears throat> sub mu sub nu, and let's just, the two things on the left side, g plus the triangle guy with g, that's the metric and the curvature of space-time. In other words, that's what's on the left side of Einstein's equation, how space-time curves and moves in response to what's on the right side of the equation. And the right side of the equation has the stress energy tensor, which is the distribution of matter, energy, and momentum in the universe, times the Einstein gravitational constant. This tiny little number that represents the tiny force of gravity, 10 to the minus 43 newtons. So this is really a small number. This is the infinitesimally small force of gravity in our universe. So that's on the right side of the equation with matter. And what the big picture view of what Einstein's equation is here <clears throat> is it saying as energy and matter move around on the right side of the equation and gravity, which is somehow attached to matter and energy, uh, the curvature of space-time is altered on the left side of the equation. And that's basically the Einstein field equation big picture. <clears throat> the distribution of all matter and energy is on the right. The curvature of space-time is on the left. So this is the big deal. You multiply Einstein's field equation by 1 over k, the Einstein gravitational constant. You multiply by the inverse of the gravitational constant, both sides of the equation. It's a simple algebraic move. And when you do the arithmetic, you see that you wind up with this modified equation, algebraically manipulated, but I don't even know what to call it, just a slight tweak of Einstein's existing equation where you have the c to the fourth over 8 pi g parentheses, the Einstein tensor and the metric tensor equals the stress energy tensor. So basically I would interpret that as this now very powerful force that's the opposite of gravity on the inverse, where gravity was very, very weak. The inverse of gravity is very, very strong. <clears throat> now gravity's on the left side of the equation where we know it belongs because we know that the LIGO detector actually detected gravity waves. So we know Einstein's theory that gravity is just the curvature of space-time is not correct because now we 
actually detected gravity waves moving through space-time. So we know gravity is waves. So this thing, this quantity, c to the fourth over 8 pi g, which Dr. Payas calls the superforce, this this force in Einstein's algebraically modified equation is outside the geometry of space-time. Contained within the parentheses is the Einsteinian tensor, the curvature of space-time, and the metric, which is the measurement of space-time. So that's space-time contained in the parentheses, and this force is somehow outside of it. The only way it could be outside of space-time that I can conceive of is if the wavelength of this radiation is at or below the Planck length, since, as I pointed out before, the boundary of this place we live is the Planck length. It doesn't go to zero here, it just goes down to the Planck length. So this force is at that boundary or below that boundary. And that's what Einstein's equation now implies. So if we get to something that um, high a frequency, it has different properties. What Dr. Payas is talking about is that at that frequency, all the instruments in the orchestra sound the same. In other words, if you play a high enough note, gravity is the same as electromagnetism and is the same as the weak nuclear force, as the same as the strong nuclear force, that there is a super force that merges all the known forces at a higher frequency beyond the Planck length. The fifth force that has merged is consciousness because another proposition here in this theory is that the superforce is one mind. It is all consciousness, which is a radiation, which is projected to us living creatures, and we are antenna that receive this transmission. Now, Another property of the superforce is that at this incredibly high wavelength, high frequency wavelength, energy density is so high that there's another physics principle that comes into play, something called the Schwinger limit, which is when you get an energy density of 10 to the 25 watts per meter squared per meter cubed, pardon me, in a confined, you know, in a single meter, you reach an energy density that's so high that matter is created from the fields. In other words, if you have a electrical fields, it's 10 to the 25 watts per meter, per cubic meter. If you have a magnetic field, it's 10 to the 18 Tesla per cubic meter. That is the Schwinger limit, and at that limit, matter is actually created out of nothing. It comes out of fields. It comes into this world from pure fields. So the big picture, based on size, or let's call it frequency, either, either way, tiny, 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 is what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to describe here is that Einstein's equations describe a universe where at the smallest scale, we are surrounded by a huge gravitational energy that is actually creating all matter and energy in space-time. So at the Planck scale, just beyond the Planck length, is the superforce here on the left side of this screen. What I'm trying to show you here in this picture is how matter and energy are created 
from literally just fields from just energy at a very high frequency which also is vibrating because it has gravity involved in it vibrations how you bring gravity in and that's on the other side of the Planck length and the Planck length forms a wall and just on the other side of that is the quantum vacuum and quantum mechanics tells the story of how this one universal energy becomes matter and momentum and all the different particle wave pairs in our universe and where our bodies live are on this side of the quantum vacuum which is what I'm trying to illustrate here is that you live in a world of big things the macro world and what I'm trying to illustrate here with this picture is that this super force and here's where I diverge from others in some way this super force is a standing wave it is a drumbeat it is a groove it is a very very high frequency groove but it is an even repetitive standing wave and all matter and energy in our world here on the right comes in and out of existence in accordance with this standing wave so the super force vibration which occurs trillions of times a second as near as I can approximate it in words it's a trillion 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 times a second um, that is a standing wave where everything here comes in and out of existence and when I say everything here I mean us and what we're looking at in other words let me talk about the merger of all five forces consciousness is a force Maxwell's demon needs a power source in order to sort through the hot and cold molecules um, the observer needs a power source as well as the observed so consciousness is not understood at this time and what I propose to say is that Einstein's view and physics actually include consciousness in this reformulation where the superforce is also the merger of consciousness and the other four forces that we know about so big picture what I'm trying to get across is that quantum mechanics describes the eternal process of creation and it fits in with this tweaked general relativity equation in that now we can see that quantum mechanics describes how the superforce over the geometry of space-time interacts with the geometry of space-time to in fact create on the right side of the equation the matter energy and momentum that is distributed in our universe and we know from recent Nobel Prize awards that both entanglement exists and that in layman's terms nothing's there till you look at it in other words in physics terms the false local reality has been confirmed nothing is actually there until we look at it which really has to be taken into account in our physics and what I'm trying to point out is that Einstein's equation already takes that into account because if you look at the equation we're saying now that consciousness acting on the geometry of space-time creates all the matter and energy and momentum in our universe so there's a super super strong force which is conscious as well as being the merger of all four known forces 
physics doesn't go away if you're trying to redefine Einstein's equation with a constant. Um, basically, what principle I'm trying to explain here is this, that the superforce is creating all matter and energy all the time, trillions and trillions of times a second, it's creating it. And that pushes out when you create matter in the geometry of space time, when you push matter into the geometry of space time from below, from the smallest possible scale, you push matter and energy into space time. The natural reaction, Newton's third law, every action deserves an equal and opposite reaction. That is what we perceive as gravity. The actual creation of matter is what gravity is pushing back at. Gravity is space-time itself pushing back on the creation of matter and energy that's being pushed into it from the outside. All right, so here's the big picture of what I'm going to tell you my model of the universe is. It's like a movie. It's like a movie camera. The super force, as we call it, that force of gravity that's super strong just beneath the Planck length, that is a carrier signal. It's a standing wave. It's, for whatever reason, it's an even drumbeat, super fast. Now, I've always imagined two mechanisms <clears throat> for how consciousness relates to that. I've, one is that our consciousness is a harmonic of the super force. And the other is one that the CIA imagined, which I put in my book, which is that the every energy wave that there is dips beneath the Planck length when at its maximum, when it's at the maximum peak or the maximum valley, since it's radiation, I imagine it's like a sine wave going back and forth. It dips and touches the super force when it reaches zero, when it changes direction right at the peak, the apex of the wave. So that could be how it works, one way or the other. The way the world works, in my opinion, is we see a frame of the world and we and the world together. It's not a virtual world per se. We and the world flash in and out of existence as a twin pair. We're completely phase locked with each other. This universe and us, the observers, the observed and the observer, blinks on and off at the exact same speed, and that's what we call our universe. And in between each frame, we touch the super force, the super for which is God, because if you think about it, not only is this energy creating the distribution of matter, energy, and momentum in the universe all the time, trillions of times a second, it's creating the consciousness of all living things. That's God. Since according to this theory, the super force, the observed and the observer are both being created and exist simultaneously in and out. And this could explain, this mechanism could explain the result of nothing is there until you look at it. I'm just venturing that opinion. But I say that's, uh, that's what was in Einstein's equation. Furthermore, for this to be the case, 
there is a faster than light connection between everything. The super force is faster than light being outside of space time, not subject to the speed limit and an unbound place between the Planck length and zero. And the super force explains that yes, Everything is entangled with everything else. There is a faster than light connection between the smallest particles of matter and not just any two particles of matter, but everything is entangled with everything. Furthermore, the recent Nobel Prizes for detecting gravity waves, this theory, this slight change to Einstein's field equations, why it explains that too, or offers an explanation for it, for why the universe is filled with gravity waves, since gravity, high, high frequency gravity, actually creates all the matter and energy in the universe. It would naturally be filled with gravitational waves. Now, so far, we've only built a low-frequency gravitational wave detector. We have not built a high-frequency gravitational detector in the public domain that we know of. So, doing a partial summary of everything we've gone over here, because I'm sure it's been a joy to talk physics with Henry. Huh? Oh, boy. Anyhow... Because this modified equation of Einstein's describes what happens beneath the Planck length on the other side of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics only works down to the Planck length, not past it. Because this modified general relativity equation does describe that, it completes quantum mechanics. It also, because it describes the merger of all five forces, including consciousness and the consciousness of all living things, as well as a consciousness that is creating all matter and energy. We are talking God does not play dice the way Einstein said it was. We are also describing a mechanism here that explains the false local reality why there's nothing until you look at it. And we're explaining why entanglement exists. The underlying mechanism for entanglement is we all come from the super force. There is one force above all that entangles us all, and it's a faster than light force. And all energy touches this force with every wave. We're also talking about the existence of gravity waves, which we now know exist. And we know Einstein's older version of his theory has to be modified. But that's what this does. Is this explains the reality of gravity waves, puts gravity on the left side of the equation. It also explains how consciousness creates reality on a universal scale, how God's consciousness creates all reality, including all of us and all of our consciousnesses. And so this underlying reality, if you imagine that we're just one of many, this is how another civilization operating at another frequency of consciousness can coexist in this place we live and be superimposed here in this place we live at another conscious frequency because consciousness and what is observed exist as a pair. And so each global mind only sees one global reality and they're paired together. Each of us sees at our own frame rate 
living human beings see at a specific frame rate. I propose that dead human beings see at a different frame rate in the afterlife. That's what I've always thought. I have thought that's the underlying mechanism behind EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, but that's another field of study. Now, what I'm going to tell you that I want you to consider is that the frame rate of Bigfoot civilization, the conscious frame rate, is a different frame rate than ours. I hope this picture makes it a little more clear. Now here's the big difference. The what you call big feet, which I would prefer to call the ancient people, can operate at multiple frame rates. We're phased locked into our frame rate. We can't change the frame rate that our consciousness moves at. The speed that we blink in and out of the universe that we're paired with this universe, we can't change that speed. But what I'm suggesting that you consider is that the big feet and other intelligent species can alter the conscious frame rate of their own consciousness and therefore move between actual different universes that are superimposed on each other because multiple frame rates of consciousness exist. Like this picture tries to draw a diagram of, you know, I like diagrams, right? So I'm trying to show you here in pictorial form what I'm saying is that there are multiple frame rates. God, the super force, is the frame rate that underlines everything and thus is in the background here. But this is basically a picture of the physics of consciousness at, well, at a very abstract level. Yes, so, hey, another picture. So this is where I try to explain the tweaked EFE completes quantum mechanics because it now describes what happens on the other side of the Planck length where there is just this intense high-frequency standing wave above the Schwinger limit that is creating all matter and energy all the time, trillions of times a second. And quantum mechanics actually explains what happens from the Planck length on up the scale until you get to the macro world where we live and our consciousness and the world that, that we see form a smooth fabric that looks like a nice analog movie. And we don't see the stitching together of all the still frames because that happens on a subconscious level. That's what our subconscious mind takes care of, is stitching together all these frames into a smooth analog movie. So it's not like we live in the matrix, but it's like we are the matrix and we live in the matrix simultaneously. So that modified Einstein equation describes not only how technologically in pure physics God creates the universe, but it describes how Bigfoot, or the ancient people, what what it means to actually have conscious control of your subconscious mind and of the true powers of the subconscious mind because Bigfoot basically can operate like the left side of Einstein's equation through focusing that super high energy, that high frequency gravity over the geometry of space-time, they can create a distribution of matter, energy, and momentum. This means shape-shifting. This means this Einstein equation actually describes how the big feet shape-shift. Since that quantity, the superforce, also is consciousness itself, 
this is why big feet can do this with just their minds alone. They can focus energy with their minds. And by doing that, they can actually make any, they can shape shift into anything in the world. And I'm trying to describe on the one hand, how Einstein's equation applies to the mental focus of Bigfoot. On the other hand, this same exact equation describes how gravometric motors work in UFOs. So, if you haven't added 1 plus 1 and yielded 2 yet, with a physics like I described here, Einstein's field equations, if you get the frequency of energy high enough, it goes faster than light. There's an edge at the edge of the universe, the Planck length, where when you fall off that edge, you're in a faster than light territory. And this is how the UAPs, etc., how their uh, propulsion systems work. This is what gravometric motors are, is in fact, this very, very, very high frequency energy that's so high frequency it falls outside the Planck length, and therefore, once you tap into it, you can move anything faster than the speed of light. Um, on a more mundane note, here in this world, let me talk about what this all really means. I read a lot of Indian legends about these guys, these ancient people, only showing up when man had lost his way so badly that unless mankind immediately changed their ways, it would face certain destruction. This is something I've encountered in a lot of the oral histories of North American tribes. Whether or not that's true, I think that there's a very important consideration nuclear weapons. We are a violent bunch. We are very violent. We have nuclear weapons and when we blow off nuclear weapons they seem to affect more than one frequency of consciousness. Not only our frequency of consciousness but adjacent frequencies of other civilizations near ours. Therefore, I believe they have a stake in whether or not we blow off nukes and where we blow off nukes and how big and where and how. And so now that we're in a phase and era at this moment where we're looking pretty reckless and it's looking like we're not going to exercise responsibility with our nuclear weapons, we might be getting a lot more attention from these people, these other people that are concerned when we start screwing up their civilization by blowing off nukes in our civilization. So, since these guys seem to be the brains of the planet and we seem to be the caretakers, that seems to be nature's role, one wonders, are they going to look kindly on our destruction of all living things forever? I mean, they've given us a lot of rope to hang ourselves, and we've just about hung ourselves. And so I wonder what their response is going to be. So far, they've laid low and had no uh, visible response to our destruction of the planet. But I suspect they may be making a more visible appearance with regards to our destruction of the planet. So I think mankind uh, may have to change their ways to face their own survival. So this is why I became a conservationist 30 years ago and worked for the tribes for 30 years as a conservationist. I know I'm just, you know, on my own soapbox talking about save the planet, save the planet, save the living things. But uh, 
it's getting to be too late and we all know it. You all know that we have to stop destroying everything.